Hello friends, today is a topic that's a very sensitive one. We're gonna be discussing who gets the house in a divorce. That's why you landed on this video. Probably I'm gonna do my best to give you some information. That's why I have invited a good friend of mine, David Traster, who's an attorney who handles real estate and divorces in both states, New York and New Jersey. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please tell everybody what do you do? Uh, I'm an attorney. I have about 20 years of experience. We have offices in New York City and in North Jersey and Fort Lee. And we do a variety of issues that we help clients solve. Some of them are real estate related, others are contracts, others are divorces, and we also do immigration. But for the purposes of this show, and we <laughs> will do uh, real estate today. Thank you so much. So as a realtor, I come across people with these types of situations. One of the th questions that come up is, do they sell the property? Do they keep the property? And we have a big argument about it. So can you shed some light about this topic? Sure. So I think what you're referring to is a process of a divorce where a couple owns the property together and they have to figure out what are they going to do with it? Are they going to sell it? Are they going to split it up somehow? Are they going to keep ownership? That happens sometimes as well in a hot market. Parties sometimes, depending on their relationship, want to keep the property and continue splitting the expenses. That's very rare. Most of the time, they either will sell the property or one spouse will buy the other out. What do I mean by buy each other out? I'm gonna use very simple math so everybody could understand. I know yes. math is not people's favorite topic. Say the house is worth 500,000, uh, they have a $300,000 mortgage. So theoretically they have $200,000 in equity. And that 200,000, each spouse is entitled to 100,000. An important thing to know in divorces is that it doesn't matter whose name is on the deed or on the property. If it was bought during the time of marriage, it's considered joint marital property and it should be split. Now, let's say there's kids involved and one of the spouses wants to stay in the house, it's the marital home, and uh, keep the kids in the same area, same school, same, Everything. Yes, that's actually a big, big thing because most people do have children and I don't think children want to be moved from their school and their friends. That creates another issue. Certainly. And uh, this more comes into play where the, the older the children are, the closer to maybe 7, 8, 9, 10. 12, 13, where they're already established into the community, they're established into the school, right. they already have their friends, their after school activities. So to pick them up and move them is not in the best interest of the children. And so a lot of times the spouses will try to negotiate, okay, well, if I have $100,000 that is owed to me, and you have 100000 that's owed to you, why don't I, it's great if I have $100,000 to give you, <laughs> and then, okay, the property stays with me. But most of the time that's not the case and the property has to be divided somehow but let's say one spouse owns the other one maybe fifty sixty thousand dollars in alimony over the okay. years so what we'll do is we'll credit that alimony towards the house so instead of you owning me fifty or sixty thousand for alimony we'll take that out of the hundred that i owe you and now i owe you forty I could pay you out over the years. Sometimes if I refinance, if we have enough equity in, in the house, then the uh, bank will give me some money to give you. And that this way they could finalize their divorce. They could sign an agreement. They don't need to go through the entire process and airing their dirty laundry in court in front of everybody and things get resolved. For consideration here is where does the second spouse want to live? How far, let's say one spouse and the children are staying in the marital home in Staten Island, and the other spouse now has to decide, well, I'm moving out, I am getting money, but where do I want to do with that money? So they would call you and they would say, hey, I need something in the area. I need something where I'm close enough to my children mm -hmm. so that I could see them more often. And this is an important part in the divorce process because a lot of times now the courts are very much going towards split equal time with the, with the party, uh, with the parties, right? Okay. 
it's the old kind of thought process that you know the mother is the home taker the mother is the one to take care of the children women work now women have their own careers they have their own businesses a lot of times it's a dad who's a stay-at-home dad not as often but it happens it happens so in this kind of situation uh, where the parties want to be close to each other for the sake of the children so the children's lives aren't distracted it's a good way to use that opportunity to say to the other spouse their attorneys or the court if it's up to that process hey like I want 50-50 custody here because it's easy for the children. We're only a couple of blocks away. Mm -hmm. I could pick up the children from school. They will still see their friends. They will still have the same extracurricular activities. Their life is not disturbed by our divorce. Okay. So a lot of times that's a good way to go about it as well. And it gets the property resolved and it gets, maybe it helps out in the divorce instead of uh, people just continually butting heads at each other and not figuring out what to do on each side. Because you get into these uh, weird situations where one spouse thinks the house is worth more, the other one just wants to sell it and is like, well, let's take the offer that we got. Let's hold out for another offer. This sometimes yeah. plays very well. In the what I find when it comes to these kind of situations and then there's the house issue is that they can't decide even on which real estate broker to choose because I don't trust them that they're going to be working for my best interest and it goes even this way. But what happens as far as the transfer? Let's say that they agree and let's say that they come up to this and we're talking more about what you mentioned sounds to me more like an uncontested divorce. The important thing to know for the audience is that no matter how much divorces are contested initially, and sometimes people are so mad at their spouse, they're so hurt by either a betrayal or the divorce process themselves that they, I get this all the time, I would rather pay the attorney in fees than give it to my spouse. People get... Emotions, uh, emotions, emotions are rule, hot. Yeah. But in mm -hmm. most cases, I would say over 95% of the cases, all divorces settle. The courts do not want these cases. They're overwhelmed, they're burdened. The divorces take a very long time. But the courts put tremendous pressure on the parties, their attorneys, to reach a settlement. So it's one thing if people reach a settlement in the beginning, and mm -hmm. sometimes they do, and it saves them time and money and emotions in terms of not dealing with the court and the other attorneys. Sometimes people are just not in that place yet initially, and they're too emotionally driven, like you were saying, where they have to, where they don't want to talk to each other. If, if, if a wife says, I want to stay in the house with the children, the other side might say, no, I want the house, even though, yes. you know, or I want to sell the house. I don't want them to stay. In the end, the court will never rule that one party or another gets to stay in the house. The court will just say, sell it. Just right, but then there's big concern of affordability. Sure. Uh, not everybody can afford no. to buy the other person. But how would that be? So if there's a mortgage, right, just going back to what we mm -hmm. said in the beginning, let's say there's $200,000 in equity. So for one person like, who's being bought out, would they have to refinance for the, what, 100000 that they owe? plus the remaining mortgage amount. Well, it's up to them how they want to refinance and their banker. Well, ultimately. assuming there's no other money available right. to just hand somebody so, a check. But maybe they want to do something to the house. So rather than borrowing, let's say the scenario you said, if they have 300,000 in equity, I mean 200 in equity and 300 in mortgage, they would refinance. They would let, the bank would do an appraisal and see how much the par or property is worth. And then they would ask the party, well, how much money do you want? Do you want us to just cover your old mortgage and transfer the property into your name? And then that's done. Both parties just sign the papers over and now the property is in the name of one spouse, the mortgage is in the name of one spouse, and they just make that payments. But it doesn't solve that situation that we were talking about. How does the other party get the money? So the first spouse might tell the bank, I need $400,000, not 300 that's actually owed. So yes, they borrow 
to pay they owe more but they are able to keep the house and they're able to pay their spouse the money and this way the deal gets done yes but it's generally done through a refinance very rarely the house is owned outright and what we could do is it's called a quit claim deed where one party generally just sells it to the other party for ten dollars because you need some kind of money exchange to be a valid contract it's not a comparable sale in the future it's a special recording for a quit claim deed but that only really exists if there is no mortgage and mm -hmm. the parties just could sign it over that makes sense the problems i feel arise is when two people can agree and then, and assuming everybody can afford to buy one another out or one party, if they don't, I think that would be not very wise from my perspective and tell me if you agree, because then you force to sell the house. It becomes that, and then there's more expenses, hiring, fighting attorneys and well, courts. Sure. And so, yes, to your point, Sometimes that gets problematic. People butt heads on the realtors. They buy butt heads on the sales price. Then they, you know, when it's time uh, to sell and they need to move out, who's moving where and how and the logistics behind all of that. And so it varies from person to person. So while financially it might make sense because yes, with a regular sale of the house, you have to pay the brokers, you have to pay the transfer tax. So that 100,000 that each is entitled to might turn into 80 now that you're actually getting it. So maybe some agreeing and getting the 100 right. is a wiser move, but that doesn't always happen. Or like you yeah. said, maybe the issue is affordability and the parties just cannot do it. They cannot, one party cannot on their own salary carry the cost of the house, right. the taxes and everything else, even if they want to keep it. And then you have the other side of the coin where people divorce is still an emotional process besides a financial one and people might have attachments and memories of the house and they don't want to be there they say i can't stay there this is too much too painful this is too yes. much of a reminder and then yes the only alternative to any of these agreements is selling the house beneficial for the parties other times it doesn't work as beneficial yeah and i've seen sadly enough i've seen in this situation why all these disagreements are happening nobody wants to pay the mortgage and then then in the end you have even bigger issues which are now you have a foreclosure knocking on your door so for me and and i think from your end it would be really really wise to just cooperate and at least have communication and discussion instead of just piling up a whole mountain of issues that... You no, know, uh, my line of thought on that, and I always tell the clients, the more you're going to cooperate in this process, the more money you're going to save. Right. Rather than paying attorneys and go and delaying the divorce and going through this process. For instance, an agreement right now, we found a way to do divorces in six to eight weeks in New York, which is very rare because uh, it's a special process. I can't. It's for people who want to get divorced uh, real quick. Yeah, for <laughs> okay. people who want to get divorced real quick, right. But generally, you know, once the divorce becomes contested, even if it's later on, is an agreement you're still looking at a year maybe a year and a half before everything is tied up in a bow and that's a long so time that's a long yeah. time because by that just time, emotionally people that's a long might time. be already on to the next part of their life maybe they've met somebody maybe they want to get married and start a, another family and they can't because the divorce mm. is still ongoing yeah. but i always tell clients save your money and spend it on your children I'm sure all this information was very helpful. Thank you, David, again for joining me. If you guys have any specific questions, I know this probably wasn't enough time to give you a lot of details about everything. Please feel free to send us an email. I'll put the email in the bottom in the description. If you'd like to privately email us with your questions and confidentiality, or feel free to comment below, ask your questions below, and uh, David and myself will do our best to help you out and answer as many questions as you possibly can. And thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for another video that we will be doing to help you out 
forward. Make sure to check out the other videos that are on my channel. Make sure to subscribe and like this video if it gave you some benefit at all. And I will see you on the next video.